like I'm in the tornado from Wizard of Oz. Legit. Well, not legit, because I haven't flown off anywhere yet. Um, but it's cyclone-esque outside. It's pretty horrible. But anyway, hi. Welcome back to The Library is Open, so I hope you brought your library cards all in. We've discussed Tong Pops previously. So yeah, it's a horrible day today. Uh, you can probably see that the lighting's a little bit subdued, but it's not <clears throat> the middle of the night or even late evening. It's actually fairly early, it's about 11 o'clock in the morning and the weather's just big old uh, bag of nonsense. <clears throat> so I'm here, I'm inside, I've got my coffee. Coffee today, not tea, who am I? Um, and I've got my dressing gown on still. Um, my little little bear who's um I was gonna say a little bear who's sleeping with me at night, that seems weird. Um, but it's my pajamas basically, because I'm not out today. I'm working from home. So uh so that's why. So I kinda like this hood though. Uh I feel a bit like a sort of camp Sith Lord. You know, like Darth Yas or something. Um that implies I know a lot about Star Wars, which is entirely inaccurate. Anyway, um so yeah, I think weather like this, you really want like comfort food, comfort drinks, and if you're me, comfort literature. Um, so this week I wanted to talk a little bit about a, a crime book, a crime novel, murder mystery, you know, whatever. Because um, I'm aware that um, the other books I've discussed previously in episodes have been sort of standalone ones, with the exception of the Buddy Vampire Slayer tie in Chosen. Um, <clears throat> I, I was a bit wary, I suppose, of doing like series of books because I know that by the time I get to read them, I'm probably quite deep into the series already, and um, that could potentially be alienating for people who haven't read the series. But I'm going to do my best. Anyway, so um, post uh, Wake Up Maggie which you'll know from me discussing it previously. I'm working on, alongside my teaching, I'm working on a new script at the moment. Uh, more details on that later. But uh, when I'm writing sort of first drafts of things and making edits and so on and so forth, my head's quite full of words and language and ideas and, and sort of constantly processing. So I, I like what I'm reading to help me switch off a little bit, which sounds a bit like a criticism of the book I'm going to describe, but it's it's not intended to. Um, so yeah, so this week, just to introduce the book, and I'll talk a little bit more about why, uh, this week's book is The Lantern Man by Ellie Griffiths. Um, smells amazing. It's a hardback, which I love, an, I love an hardback, that little, not when you break the spine, but you know a little squeak when you go like that. Oh, I love that. It's like ASMR. I wonder if there are any ASMRs of people breaking spines of books. It feels like heresy, but it also kind of feels good. Um, and this edition I love because it's from Waterstones, this again. They need to put me on their PR list, seriously. Um, but it's signed, look, by Ellie Griffiths. What I really like about that is, like, they do authors' events at Waterstones, but, like, I don't like queuing. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't know that they'd, um, that they'd had an event with Ellie. Um, but they'll have like her sign or the author sign a load of copies and then you can just buy them if you didn't go to the event which I think is great but so why crime I mentioned in um, an earlier video that I really like cheap crime which I want to kind of take that back because it's not cheap it sounds like I'm like devaluing crime fiction which is actually <clears throat> crime fiction is some of I think the best plotted uh, and probably most tightly plotted kind of literature out there because it can't afford to be sprawling or non-narrative driven it really has to stick to rules and and everything sort of has to tie up effectively so I, I feel like I was doing a disservice and what I meant by cheap crime I suppose is um do excuse me it's it's probably books that are not likely to win the Booker Prize but that's not necessarily an indicator of anything I don't I'm, I'm not a snob when it comes to to writing at all. I'll read anything as long as it's well done. Um, I've always really liked, see it's not, when I say crime it's less sort of 
like thrillers and more sort of what I think in the industry they call cosy crime. So these are sort of, you know, you're very sort of Agatha Christie like little village murders uh, steeped in like nostalgia and this weird idea of like old England. Quite liked that, old England. Um, yeah, I think that stems back a lot to, to being a kid. So I remember my mum had... Um, a little sip of coffee. Um, my mum had the big um, orange hardback of, I think they were about five Miss Marple books or something uh, by Agatha Christie. So she was sort of like my, my gateway drug into crime fiction. And it's since gone on from there. So I'll, I'll read stuff. By, like, I read the entire Agatha Christie oeuvre. When we used to go on holiday as a kid, If we didn't always go on holiday, but if we did, it tended to be uh, to Torquay in Devon, uh, which... Uh, obviously is Agatha Christie country so they had like a little shop there that you could go around and she just go around and like, look at all the things like the tie-ins all the books you know there was a map of, of places you could go that she'd written I loved that I made my nan go with me bless her she's sort of like long suffering in the background like oh, fine we'll go and look around another house um, that she wants you know moved a typewriter in something like that but um, so that was like as I say that was my gateway but um, yeah, and ever since then, I just I just really like that atmosphere of of nostalgia and sort of there's a pervading sense that in the end everything will be okay and um, horrific things might happen on the way, but they're not sort of like they're not terrorist attacks, they're not spy attacks, they're sort of very domestic murders, and I kind of enjoy that. Um, one sort of family murder, you know, like a big old country house and the Baron gets shot, love that. Uh, anyway, Ellie Griffiths um, writes this series called the Dr. Ruth Galloway Mysteries and they're kind of an interesting blend of like cosy crime and modern. Um, I say modern in the sense that they follow a more contemporary pattern of, of um, sort of quick fire writing. I'm thinking like James Patterson style here in the sense that the chapters are quite short and they and they move along at quite a brisk pace so it's set in the modern day but with that sort of there's the feeling of that old-fashioned homage to crime of the classic era um so the lantern men is the latest published 2020 uh the first book in this series which i discovered quite by accident i think it was like a quid on kindle or something i was just like yeah all right um was called uh the crossing places <clears throat> i set up the basic premise of the series is there's, uh, the main character is Dr. Ruth Galloway, who is a forensic archaeology lecturer at the University of North Norfolk. North. North Norfolk. And she lives on the Salt Marsh, which is this um, sort of described as this like weird place between land and sea that was... Um, very sort of important to like uh, the druid civilizations and um, um, pre-monolithic tribes I guess would that be an accurate way to describe it anyway it's old uh, and it's supposed to have some sort of connection to mystical earth energies and so on and so forth <clears throat> yeah so she's this lecturer and in the first book she meets this uh, detective uh, called Harry Nelson, who enlists her help as an archaeologist to when there's some bones that are uncovered. Um, and that sort of kickstarts their friendship, which, as the series progressive, becomes uh, more than friendship, let's say. Um, now, The Lantern Men is the 12th book in the Dr. Ruth Galloway Mysteries. Uh, she also has another series set in the 40s, 50s uh, in Brighton, which is also murders, um, which is called the, the well, it's called the Brighton Mysteries. Sort of says it, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, um, as with any sort of long-running series, the um, the characters are established, um, relationships are formed. So like Harry Nelson has a couple of people that he works with in the police, uh, Judy and Dave, and Ruth has a friend called Michael, also known as Cathbad, who's a uh, druid, druidic shaman. Um, she has a child, eventually. 
by the time we get to this novel, uh, she's about nine years old. And uh, she has like sundry friends from the university. Uh, so that's basically a potted history. But you'd probably need to read the full series to get the appreciation. Now in The Lantern Men, Ruth has just moved to Cambridge because uh, relations with uh, Harry Nelson have turned a little bit awkward over the years. And um, no spoilers. And uh, yeah, she's, she's met this new guy, an American called Frank. And they've moved to Cambridge where she is... Uh, working at St. Jude's College. Now, the premise of this book is that uh, Nelson has just arrested a guy called Ivor March for the murders of three women and possibly three more. We're not sure. Um, <clears throat> all of whom were blonde, sort of tall, slim. He, so it's like there was a type, as it were, of people that he murdered and uh, buried. Um, and... Well, he is in prison after the court case, um, possibly on remand. I think, no, I think he's in prison. I think he's been charged with the first murders because his DNA was all over the bodies. Um, Ruth gets an anonymous note um, which asks her to uh, go and see this guy. So she comes back down to Norfolk and she meets this guy and he tells her where to dig for other other bodies because he wants... Um, because he respects her, she's like a leading light in her field, sort of thing. And so she manages to uncover two other bodies, <clears throat> which Harry is desperate to tie to this guy called Ivor as uh, part of his serial killer spree. Um, but events uh, unfold and a third body is discovered, buried with these other two, and Ruth starts to become uneasy about the prospect of Ivor as the murderer and she starts to wonder if he really is the killer uh, or if he's protecting someone. So she does some investigation and uh, finds out that Ivor was part of a, a sort of commune of like-minded folk called Grey Walls where the uh, there were three men and a woman, two women, sorry, and they would take in stray Travellers, backpackers and so on and so forth and teach them about art and life. It sounds a bit dodgy, but um, it, But it's also kind of above board so they would like take them in for a few months and then they'd move on and uh, the they would they would prowl The area looking for people that were lost and they called themselves the lantern men now this ties in with a legend through uh, Ruth's friend Cathbad who is well up on all sort of uh, mythologies um, and so on and so forth. He remembers a legend of, of a phenomenon called the Lantern Men who were said to be cast out of heaven but also out of hell and given a, a lump of coal by Satan to put uh, to light their way as they wander the earth endlessly on the marsh. And the legend is that they lured people to their death. Now, one of the victims or one of the bodies, had written a short story called The Lantern Men about um, becoming embroiled with someone she calls the artist and being drawn to uh, the lights on the moor, or not, not the moor, the marshes, sorry, which ultimately lead her to her death. And, and it turns out that the the legend of the Lantern Men is, is mirrored in a lot of cultures across the world, so it's also the basis for the jack-o'-lantern at Halloween. Um, the sort of lump of coal inside the pumpkin to lead the way. And uh, yeah, so it becomes a much more complicated investigation than it first appears to be. Meanwhile, Ruth's sort of dealing with emotional upheavals because Frank, the, new, the newer boyfriend who they live together now, wants to uh, take a holiday with her and she keeps experiencing uh, panic attacks as though something's not, she can't breathe. So once in the swimming pool, for instance, she's um, finds herself short of breath and she just can't get air into her lungs. So she's trying to uncover what that means about her, which I'm, I'm probably suggests that there's something not right in her relationship. And she can't quite forget this connection that she's got with Harry Nelson who, by the way, is already married with three children. So it's intensely complicated. 
Now, what I love about this is um, the blending of mythology and contemporary uh, society is lovely. I'm really big fan of being a writing teacher. I love looking at the uh, the genesis of storytelling, and I just find it so fascinating how. One of, the, one of the basic things I tell my students in the first couple of weeks is that every story has already been told. So it doesn't matter what the story is, what matters is who's telling it. That's, what, that's what's important, that's, that's what makes it different. Um, and, but I do also find it really fascinating that uh, these, with, with regional variations, the same stories exist all over the world. And they sort of predate like modern travel and, and modern communications and so on and so forth. So I don't have an answer for why that would be other than, you know, perhaps something in the human psyche or, you know, um, the inheritance in, in um, how would I explain it? The sort of, it, almost that it's like a living a living inheritance that's passed down. You've you've heard of things like um, uh, racial memory and so on and so forth, where uh, past injustices or instances of racism of oppression are almost said to pass through the genes. And I wonder if it's something similar with stories. You know, they are a human need to understand for catharsis for. Um, just generally making sense of the world, confronting our worst fears, and so on and so forth. So I find that really interesting, and, and what Ellie Griffiths does really nicely is sort of blend those two with this sort of fantastical idea of, of druidic mythology, and indeed g global mythology, with the here and now of murder, but it never feels eggy, in the sense that she's trying to force like fantasy elements onto things that are resisting fantasy, they sort of complement one another, particularly with the backdrop she's chosen, obviously. Just pour a bit more coffee. Oh, I've run out, that's really sad. Um, particularly with the backdrop of, of Norfolk and um, Cambridge, you know, like these are old cities, sort of steeped in history, and there's very much the sense that they're an uneasy blend of the modern and the ancient at the same time. Um, I think that's what I mean. <laughs> um, what's interesting about this is, which it used to be a real hatred of mine, um, it's written in the present tense. So he says, she does. And I used to really hate that. I, I was much more a fan of, he said, she did. You know, of things in the past tense, which sort of tried to unpick a little bit. I'm like, why is that? And does that, does that sort of speak to as I've sort of talked about a little bit on the channel before, um, do I find things easier to reflect on after the fact? Do I like things in past tense because it feels safer, because it's already a foregone conclusion? Um, I don't know, just uh, things to think about for me. Um, let me know what you think about tenses in writing, by the way. Do you like to live in the, in the present tense with, like, he says this, she does that, or do you prefer a more reflective tense? Uh, but I've got over it. I've got over it. Um, and you sort, of, you sort of don't really notice after a while. Like, I, I, I've read 12 of these now because I read the whole series. That's very like me if I find a writer I like. And I know the sequels. I like investing in the character. Um... Oh, which, speaking of which, this is really helpful, sort of, at the back of the book. Very sort of helpful, like, who's who guide. So that if you did pick this up and you didn't want to read the whole series, although I definitely think you should, um, I think you can get collections, actually, on, dare I say, Amazon, um, where you can get, like, books one to three, books four to six for, like, two ninety Don't quote me, that might not be right, but fairly cheap. Um... So yeah, there's your inroad uh, with the characters. Um, yes, yeah, so I've worked past that and you sort of don't really notice after a while. You're just caught up in the action and the chapters are short enough that this is what I call a bedtime book. So I'm like propped up on my futon. Oh, hello. 
Uh, don't know what that was. Uh, possibly a fairy. Mm. Um, I'm propped up on my little futon, which, as I say, seemed like such a good idea at the time. It's not. It's not. Many apologies. Got cut off there, ever so slightly, by a phone call from my mother. Hey, Mom. Bless her. Yeah, so it's a great bedtime book. You can be like, say, five chapters or something like that, and there's a definite place to put your bookmark, which is really satisfying. <laughs> So good. The only downside is you read it, you tend to read it quite quickly because it gives you that sort of false short chapter syndrome. That's not a real thing. I have just made that up and I'll admit that. Um, where you're sort of like, oh, there's only another four pages in that chapter. I'll just keep going. Um, you know, I am notorious for not lingering over books. Um, it's hard and fast. Hard and fast. Like a Chemical Brothers song. Do PR for them as well. They can pay me. Um, so yeah, that was this week's book. I do recommend you start with the first book in the series, as I say, The Crossing Places. Uh, this is book 12, just to reiterate, I'll just show it again. Um, just because it's fascinating and it's, you know, full of the great tropes of storytelling through the ages with a contemporary twist. So bravo, uh, Ellie Griffiths. You're a good egg. I like you. Please be my friend and let's go for coffee. Or tea. No, let's go for tea. I've had enough coffee now. That'll do. That'll do. In my defence, as I say, the weather is absolutely disgusting today. So, it's a hate crime. But, uh, good. So that's, to, that's this week's episode. And next week's uh, Read of the Week will be posted in the description along with a schedule, which I have decided to do, of the upcoming uh, books that I'm going to be talking about. I think I'm going to go with, like, the next... The next three seems okay uh, for the time being, after this one. Um, just so you can, as I said in the last video, follow along if you want. If you don't want, that's fine too. But yes, as ever, on this horrible day, keep yourself wrapped up warm. And um, practice good self-care by drinking hot beverages of your choice. Uh, keep your library card handy. Keep those pages turning. Sniff them if you like. I won't tell anyone. So that was The Library is Open Zorling, and for now, the library is closed. All right, take care, lots of love.